I'm Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. This is the first lecture in this series on mechanical ventilation, and this will serve as a bit of an introduction to the topic and provide a little historical context as well. Here are the learning objectives of this initial lecture. First, to know the general indications for intubation and mechanical ventilation. And the second, to understand the conceptual differences between positive and negative pressure ventilation. As I begin discussing mechanical ventilation in this first lecture, the most obvious place to start is simply to ask what is it? In the most general sense, mechanical ventilation is any means in which physical devices or machines are used to either assist or replace spontaneous respiration. There are four major indications for mechanical ventilation. First, the need for high levels of inspired oxygen that might accompany hypoxic respiratory failure. Second, the need for assisted ventilation. This can be seen with either hypercapnic respiratory failure or more commonly as part of routine protocol for surgical procedures done under general anesthesia. Third, protection of the airway against aspiration. This could be an issue for patients with neurologic catastrophes or drug overdose. And finally, relief of upper airway obstruction in, in situations such as anaphylaxis, soft tissue infections of the neck, or severe head and neck trauma. On the most fundamental level, the first distinction to make when classifying mechanical ventilation into different categories is whether the ventilator relies on positive or negative pressure to move the chest wall and diaphragm and to create the pressure gradients that drive gas in and out of the lungs. With negative pressure ventilation, which was the first to be developed, pressure lower than atmospheric pressure is applied to the extrathoracic space during inspiration. While with positive pressure ventilation, pressure higher than atmospheric pressure is applied to the intra-alveolar space during inspiration. Those of you who have heard of negative pressure ventilation may know that it is almost never used in acute medicine anymore and may wonder why I'm even going to spend time discussing it. Um, however, aside from the historical context it will provide, a quick review of the physiology of negative pressure ventilation will help to better understand the physiology of positive pressure ventilation. Let's look at some illustrations. Here's a schematic of the lung. External to the lung is the outside world where we will set the atmospheric pressure to zero for reference. The single oval cavity in the middle represents all the intraalveolar space where at rest and at equilibrium the pressure is also zero. The orange shell is the pleural space, which in reality is actually quite thin, much more so than it appears from this picture. There are some mechanical forces at work here, even with the lungs at rest. These will be discussed more in detail in a later lecture, but I will sim simplify it by stating that the lungs themselves exert an inward force on the pleural space due to their elastic recoil. Likewise, the chest wall exerts an outward force on the pleural space due to its own elastic recoil. Therefore, the pressure in the pleural space is negative at rest. Five centimeters of water is a relatively typical value. I'm now going to go through how these pressures change during a respiratory cycle with both negative and positive pressure ventilation. While leaving in the intrapleural pressure and including its effects at various times will lead to a more complete understanding of this physiology, uh, it will make things significantly more complicated, so I'm just going to leave it out for now. So first, with negative pressure ventilation, uh, the basic principle is that either the thorax or more commonly the entire torso is enclosed in an airtight chamber, leaving the head and neck exposed. Inspiration is triggered by application of negative pressure within that chamber. This increases the outward pull on the chest wall, which is transmitted through the pleural space to the lungs to expand them. Physical expansion of the lungs leads to increased intraalveolar volume, which drops the intraalveolar pressure. You may notice that the external negative pressure doesn't equal the intraalveolar pressure. Uh, this discrepancy is because the inward elastic recoil of the lungs somewhat blunts the outward pulling force. Now, if you remember that the patient's mouth and nose are at atmospheric pressure, which is at zero, you'll realize that the pressure gradient will drive the flow of air into the lungs, thus inspiration. As air flows into the lungs, the intraalveolar pressure reaches an equilibrium with atmospheric pressure, and when that occurs, airflow will cease. 
you'll notice that the inward force at this point still roughly equals the outward force, despite the pressures being quite different. Uh, that's because of that elastic recoil of the lung again, uh, which is accentuated when higher volumes stretch it further, just like a rubber band or a coiled spring. Uh, expiration is then triggered by the pressure in the chamber returning to atmospheric pressure. Now the inward force with the additional recoil from inflation is greater than the outward force. This pulls the lungs back in. Deflation of the lungs increases intraalveolar pressure and the pressure gradient drives gas back out again. For another perspective on this, let's take a look at a graph of pressure as a function of time for one respiratory cycle. The gray line at zero represents atmospheric pressure and the red line will represent the external pressure set by the ventilator. During inspiration, when the ventilator provides negative external pressure, there is a smooth transition from an intraalveolar pressure of zero to some negative value, uh, a little shy of that set pressure. Then as air flows into the lungs, the pressure gradient resolves and intraalveolar pressure turns to atmospheric. During expiration, the set pressure goes to zero. This triggers a smooth increase in intraalveolar pressure to some positive value, which pushes gas back out until the pressure then again returns to zero. The first negative pressure ventilator to enter a clinical use was invented by uh, two Harvard professors in 1928. It was initially called the drinker respirator after one of the inventors, but uh, quickly became known as the iron lung. Here's a picture of it. Uh, the patient's body would lie supine in the tube with their head sticking out of the hole at the top, uh, resting on that comfortable looking metal tray. Uh, you can see a mirror above where the head would lie, which would be the uh, what the patient used to look at their uh, care providers and visitors since they couldn't move themselves. The removable panels on the sides allowed doctors and nurses to perform rudimentary examinations and provide hygiene without having to remove the patient from the chamber. Uh, now during the polio outbreaks of the 1940s and 50s, entire wards of hospitals were filled with children in iron lungs as polio commonly affects the diaphragm and can reduce a patient's ability to take in breaths. Although images such as this may seem uh, depressing today, without the iron lung, uh, probably every single patient in this ward would, would have died. Uh, it may seem to you to look quite uncomfortable uh, and restrictive to be in an iron lung, and you may wonder how long a person could possibly tolerate such an inter uh, intervention. Here's a picture of um, a woman, uh, her name's Diane O'Dell, uh, Ms. O'Dell was three years old when she contracted polio. Uh, unfortunately, unlike most polio patients who recover most, if not all, of the lung function, uh, she did not. Uh, and instead, she lived a remarkable 58 years in this iron lung, uh, much of it spent in a family home in Tennessee. Unfortunately, she passed away in 2008 uh, after the home's emergency generator failed during a power outage. It's kind of an uh, unfortunate end to a very sad and tragic life. While they are quite rare these days for reasons we'll get to, um, iron lungs no longer need to look like a contraption from a Jules Verne novel. Uh, here is a picture of a modern negative pressure ventilator known as a port a lung. Uh, and no, I'm not kidding about that uh, amusing name. Let's now look at positive pressure ventilation. Uh, the first serious research on positive pressure ventilation didn't occur in the hospital but rather in a research lab where the military was investigating better ways to deliver oxygen to high altitude pilots during the 1940s. Positive pressure ventilators didn't enter the medical setting until the 1960s and were still quite rare until the 1970s, which I still find amazing considering how ubiquitous these life-saving life uh, devices are just a generation later. With positive pressure ventilation, instead of the body being placed in the chamber, a small tube called an endotracheal tube is introduced into the trachea, usually via the mouth. An airtight seal is made between the endotracheal tube and the trachea by means of a soft-sided cuff that is inflated once the tube is in place. With positive pressure ventilation, positive pressure is applied to the air within the endotracheal tube. Uh, this pressure gradient drives the flow of air into the lungs, which then expand once the intraalveolar pressure is equalized with the endotracheal tube pressure, airflow stops. You'll notice that here at end inspiration, although there is positive pressure in the intraalveolar space and atmospheric pressure in the extra thoracic space, uh, the forces on the respiratory apparatus are balanced 
That's because the additional outward force from the positive pressure is balanced by the inward elastic recoil once again. Uh, expiration is triggered by removal of the positive pressure being applied to the tube. Now the pressure gradient drives gas out of the lungs. As equilibrium is reached and the intraalveolar pressure reaches zero, the net force on the lung now favors elastic recoil, leading to lung deflation. Let's take a look at a graph of intraalveolar pressure as a function of time. Once again, the dashed gray line will be atmospheric pressure, um, set at zero for reference. The dashed red line will be the extrinsic pressure applied via the endotracheal tube. You can see that application of a constant pressure, constant, as a constant positive pressure, uh, that is, at the beginning of inspiration, results in the intraalveolar pressure reaching equilibrium with it towards the end of inspiration. With release of that extrinsic pressure, the intraalveolar pressure quickly drops back down to zero. Before we move on, I want to point out that what I've shown you with these schematics and graphs is a substantial simplification of the actual process. Uh, respiration doesn't happen in a sequence of well-delineated steps like I went through, uh, but rather as a continuous smooth process. Uh, volumes and pressures change simultaneously, not in a series like these animations uh, might make it appear. Let's take a look at some positive pressure ventilators. First, here is the endotracheal tube, frequently abbreviated ET tube. Uh, the balloon on the right side is the cuff, which creates the airtight seal within the trachea. The cuff can be inflated or deflated through the uh, blue port. Here's a woman with an ET tube connected to a conventional positive pressure ventilator. There are a variety of methods to keep the ET tube in place. Uh, this patient has a special strap specifically designed for that purpose. It's actually not all that uncommon to see the ET tube simply taped to the patient's face, which I don't necessarily recommend, but uh, frequently is, is jerry-rigged when the uh, special strap is not available. Uh, the ET tube is attached to a Y connector, um, off of which run two larger caliber tubes, one white, one clear in this case. Um, one of the tubes is the inspiratory limb of the ventilator circuit through which oxygen-rich gas travels to the patient's lungs, and the other tube is the expiratory limb through which carbon dioxide-rich gas travels away from the patient's lungs. Uh, in the back and partly cut off is the actual ventilator itself. Modern ventilators are quite sophisticated. Here are two popular models that you will likely see around the ICU. Now that we've reviewed a little of the physiologic differences between negative and positive pressure ventilation, what are some of the practical differences? Let's take a look at the major advantages of each. Negative pressure ventilation is non-invasive, does not require sedation, allows the patient to still eat and talk relatively normally, and it is probably associated with a lower risk of aspiration. Positive pressure ventilation is able to provide higher levels of inspired oxygen. It is more effective for providing large driving pressure gradients for patients with poor lung compliance. There is an increased ability to individualize treatment as there are many more uh, options on positive pressure ventilators than negative pressure ventilators. And finally, it can provide full vent support for unconscious patients. The bottom line is that negative pressure ventilators were a near perfect solution to dealing with large numbers of children with polio and subsequent diaphragmatic paralysis. The patients are cognitively intact and with normal lung parenchyma. Unfortunately, they really only work for patients with neuromuscular disease and its associated hypoventilation. Uh, that specific type of respiratory failure makes up a tiny, tiny percentage of all patients requiring mechanical ventilation. Therefore, the portal lung aside, uh, negative pressure ventilators are rarely used in practice today and have been relegated to museum exhibits. I hope you have found this introduction to mechanical ventilators to be both interesting and useful. Uh, please continue now to lesson two on normal lung mechanics.